Okay, welcome everyone. Um, today, I'd like to take you through a little bit of a, a thought piece uh, covering the concept of makers and takers. This idea came from a blog post that Dries did uh, a couple of years ago now. And I'll also be talking about uh, the concept of altruism and uh, offering a few ideas as to you know, how Drupal might uh, you know, continue to, to prosper and uh, you know, improve in the future. So as I said, it all started with a blog post uh, from Dries uh, a couple of years ago. And in, in that blog post, he was talking about the concept of makers and takers. Uh, makers are people that uh, use Drupal or any open source software, but also uh, invest you know, time and energy into the open source project itself. And these are people are, are contrasted to takers who will, will use the software, but not actually contribute back uh, to the open source project. Um, I thought the article was really interesting from you know a number of angles. You know, firstly, I thought it was great that Dries was you know taking a uh, a, a bigger view of um, you know open source projects. Uh, you know what the uh, sort of underlying uh, forces were um, within them, uh, but he's also touched on a, a few different economic uh, and philosophical concepts as well. There as well, trying to to understand just how we can convert. Uh, takers into makers and, you know, develop an ecosystem that will survive, not just for, um, you know, one year or two years, but, you know, decades and even centuries. For, that's the sort of the kind of uh, timescale he's uh, thinking of there. How, how can we build an ecosystem uh, for that? So if you haven't read that article, uh, please do, because I, I think it's, yeah, quite, it's been quite influential in, in how Dries has been thinking uh, about the project moving forward. Um, I watch a lot of funny YouTube videos and uh, one day this video popped up in my stream uh, about green bearded altruism. That title was weird enough that I just ignored it for a week or so, but you know, finally I relented and uh, clicked on it and I was really, really surprised to see um, what it was about. Um, so yeah, the, the title of the, the video that really got me writing of the blog post uh, about this subject and, and this presentation today is called Simulating Green Bearded Altruism. And I can't say enough nice things about the, you know, this particular channel and the way uh, it's been done. So it's, it's got a mix of, you know, economics and philosophy, uh, you know, statistics, computer science, visualization, it's, it's just a, you know, a beautiful thing to behold. So uh, <laughs> go check, watch that video in full and uh, you know, also check out some of the other videos on that channel. But really what I want to talk about here is you know, this, this video really segues very nicely into what Dries was talking about with the makers and takers. Uh, in this case, we're talking about altruists and cowards. So the altruists are the, uh, the makers and the, the cowards are the, the takers. Uh, the simulation you're about to see is this little world where you have a forest and the blobs go into the forest and harvest fruit and then there's these nasty tree monsters that will uh, eat them you know the 50 cents 50 percent probability uh if if the uh, blobs survive they go home to reproduce and if they don't obviously they've they've been eaten so the nasty tree mon monsters are essentially the you know the capitalist markets that we operate in you know there are winners and, and losers there sometimes you win sometimes you lose uh the, the blobs really are, are potentially our competitors or our uh, our friends and uh, the altruists in this particular case will tell the, the, the cowards about the tree monsters. In so doing, they risk, the, uh, they risk being eaten. Uh, so there, there is a cost to being an altruist. Um, so if you go through the video, yeah, you'll see all of that unfold. I'm gonna show you just the last bit where there are four different actors. So you have true altruists. Uh, these are the ones who um, are altruistic and help other altruists out. And they also wear a green beard to demonstrate that they're an altruist. Um, you have the suckers, they're the altruists who don't uh, have any outward signs of being an altruist. So you don't know if they're kind of, kind of good or bad. Um, so yeah, they're the suckers because no one knows to help them. Uh, you have the cowards who are the, the takers, essentially they're, they're the people uh, who, who don't wanna tell anyone about the, 
a nasty tree monster, or in, in Drupal's case, uh, are just the takers of the software. And then the fourth version is an imposter. They're, they're cowards who are particularly devious and pretend to be altruistic. So what happens with the imposters is that the, the true altruists will still help out, or, or sorry, all altruists will help out the imposters because they look like um, altruists. So, okay, so that, that's laying the foundation. You may just think this is all a little bit weird, but I'm just gonna flip over to the video now and then we can um, see see this uh, in action. So um, here we go. And I take it you guys can hear all this, by the way. Uh, I don't hear anything if I'm supposed to be. No, you can't hear. Okay. All right. Bevan just tells me you guys can't hear. I'm sorry about that. Um, but what I will do is I will kind of narrate as we go along. So sorry about this. So this is the simulation of the world. And we have got those four different blob types going out into the world and, and competing basically. And then up in the top left corner, you'll, you'll just see the, the various proportions of blobs and how they how they survive. So they're going out from their homes out into the, the nasty world. There are some tree monsters in there that might eat them. And then we can see that the, uh, the red ones, they're the imposters. You can see the imposters have uh, successfully won out in this case. Uh, the green beards, they're the greens. They did well for a while, but they rapidly uh, fell away. And the suckers there who are the, the blue ones, they, they lost out very quickly. And yeah, depressingly, just the, the straight out cowards still survived. And of course, we, we have the imposters that, uh, that won, um, won out in, in the end. So I'm sorry you guys didn't get to hear the sound on that one, but hopefully you, you, get, uh, you get a very quick appreciation of, of what's going on there. It's um, the basic takeaway is being an altruist is, uh, is not so great. Um, the imposters and the, the straight out cowards will uh, will succeed. So with that, I'll, I'll just flip back to the presentation. And, uh, and I really encourage you guys to, to watch that a little bit more just, just to, to get it in its full glory. But yeah, what, what are the, uh, the core insights from this uh, video? Well, you know, mostly being an altruistic is a lousy strategy, you know, if and just relating this back to Drupal, if you are contributing to the project, is that there is a cost being uh, imposed upon you there. You know, it's basically time and money and uh, energy. And for those that are not contributing, they don't have that cost, so they're at a competitive advantage. However, in certain circumstances, altruists can win out. And that's where the altruists signal that they're altruistic and other altruists are able to help them out. So in, in Drupal speak, you know, this is just members of the community helping out other people in the community and making sure that, you know, they're able to, to win in a commercial environment. But I, I think you got the kicker there is that you don't want imposters to trick the altruists into thinking that they are indeed an altruist. Uh, otherwise, the imposters will, will just win out. So that, that's quite a, a funny one, but I, I guess if you're applying that to Drupal, it would be like you, you know, let's let's try to make sure that the uh, the takers are being brought into the fold and and not sort of staying outside and and just paying uh, lip service to to open source software. Um, yeah, so Dries has picked up on this recently as well at DrupalCon uh, Global. That was just a few weeks ago. I know that's a, a massive um, quote, but I, I just think it was interesting because in in this particular case, like Dries just naturally came back and started talking about the makers and takers again. And uh, one of his thinking has kind of developed to to linking uh, linking things to a financial incentive. And he talked about routing leads to organizations uh, so that, um, you know, leads that, Organizations that are contributing are receiving more leads and this will increase their chances of, of having uh, success and survival and then increasing you know, the chance of Drupal's uh, survival. Uh, Dries goes on to note that sometimes he feels that we're afraid to talk about these topics 
probably because you know it involves money and and financial incentives and we're talking about open open software here who's uh, who's uh, free uh, free as in beer and, and free as well so i you know i guess it's it's good for us to talk about these things and that's partly uh, the reason uh, I'm, I'm bringing this up today so applying this to drupal what Dries was talking about two years ago has been applied to the Drupal marketplace. You're probably familiar with the, the, uh, the rankings of different Drupal agencies according to how much they contribute. Um, what commits are they doing to core and to contrib? Uh, are they people speaking at conferences and, you know, and being involved in the community? So that the Drupal marketplace is something that's really come along. It's been driven by things like, you know, badges for contributing to um, the Drupal Association, uh, as well as the, the contributions that I've mentioned, as well as providing case studies and these kinds of things. So the marketplace has been gamified and that in turn has led to probably more financial uh, money flowing back into the, the Drupal Association. And I think that's really kind of what you've seen after the, the initial makers and takers uh, so the thought piece there, you have um, people being uh, essentially monitored for what their contributions are and being rewarded in that way. But I would, I would like to take this thinking further and I'll just offer up a, a few other ideas that could be uh, developed on top of that. So firstly, I, I think the marketplace is quite inward looking. Uh, you know, I think probably it's people like me and Drupal agencies that actually get worried about that kind of thing. And, um, you know, we, we're part of the game and uh, you know, trying to improve our agency's standing. And, you know, that in turn will have a positive uh, benefit to the, the project. After all, it is um, companies that sponsor or fund individual developers to contribute to the project that leads to most of the, the code going into core. So I, I think there, there is a positive feedback there, but I don't know if that's necessarily been reflected out into potential clients. I, I think it's more of an inward looking thing. So I, I would say, yeah, trying to expose the, the marketplace or people's contributions in a wider way uh, would be a, you know, a good first step here. We also hear about the little guy. Uh, the marketplace is very much um, skewed towards larger companies because they are able to, you know, they've got more resources and they're able to make more contributions. However, there are sort of smaller Drupal companies out there that are easily uh, competing pound for pound and, you know, putting in a bigger effort in a percentage basis. So I would say, hey, why don't we normalize these contributions, um, divide them by the number of staff at a particular company and see how they're going. And then we'll see how the little guy uh, is going. And I think you'll find there are a whole ton of agencies out there who are smaller, but pound for pound are, are uh, you know, punching above their weight, shall I say. And, you know, I think that would be a really interesting insight into the Drupal community and, and who is, who's um, contributing the most on a proportional basis. Um, talking, turning towards advertising on Drupal. Oops, I spell ads incorrectly there. I apologize for that. Um, we have an ad space quite prominent on the bottom of most, if not all, pages on Drupal.org. And this is this space is used to, to publicize companies that are prepared to pay the money there. When I saw that, I felt a, I got a little bit of a surprise, really, because I, I think this privatized space is promoting a subset of uh, companies um, rather than all of the, uh, the makers. And I, I think the Drupal Association could open this space up a little bit more. I'm sure there'd be plenty of makers out there who would want to um, sponsor that, that slot. And I see no reason for that to be as privatized uh, as it is. So I think if that was opened up to a wider range of makers, that would, um, that would benefit the altruism and you know, the, the feedback loop. Um, the Drupal Association, you know, does a great job. It supports uh, Drupal and, you know, the Drupal infrastructure. Um, you know, it, it uh, you know, provides governance and runs DrupalCons and, and uh, you know, brings the community together. So I, I think it does a great job at doing that and we should all support that. So if you haven't signed up for membership, I would encourage you to do so because that's, that's the most pragmatic thing you can do to, to support the DA. 
However, the DA does not write the code. So supporting the DA will get you a certain way there for providing infrastructure and the governance, but it's not gonna actually help code actually be uh, written. And that's the thing I'd like to, to talk to talk about really is just how can we support developers better. Uh, developer burnout in the community is a thing, you know, um, supporting, uh, you know, large modules is, you know, takes time and stress. And uh, recently, you may be aware of Jacob Rokovitz, um, web form module maintainer, sort of stressing out about not being able to support the module. Um, it's a module used by hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, it, it makes a lot of people a lot of money and yet you know, Jacob's getting a whole lot of feature requests and support requests. So that got too much. And, you know, Jacob wrote a whole series of articles there, um, you know, detailing his experiences and just what he was going to do. The solution was to turn to Open Collective, which is um, sort of like a non-profit, US-based non-profit that will hold funds uh, in trust. And then, you, you know, um, it will pay them out when, when people have, you know, um, Done, done the work and essentially invoice it. So Jacob's found a one-off solution, you know, for the web form um, problems there. Um, and I, I think that's that's been by, by and large a good good approach. It's it's been a you know, transparent one and um, it, it is sort of easing the pain there. But the, the problem is it's just a one-off approach that an individual has uh, has made. So what I would really proposing is like, how can we sort of close this loop between uh, these two different people, you know, companies with deep pockets and shallow expertise and developers with shallow pockets and deep expertise. So I think we can bring some takers who want to be makers into the fold if we're able to, um, you know, show that there are, there are benefits to being um, uh, makers. And by doing that, by then providing a pool of funds for these other developers who, who actually need the support. So the makers I'm referring to here are not ones that have worked for companies that are able to fund them, but ones who, are, who don't, do not have that support. And I, I think bringing those two groups together could, could uh, sort of close the, the loop and um, you know, bring the wins to both these parties. So yeah, why don't we try to systemize that open uh, collective uh, approach develop a pool of um, funds and uh, you know, spread that out amongst a team of quality community-based uh, developers who are then rewarded for implementing high value features. This is not a new idea. I know, you know people have spoken about this for a long, long uh, time and it's, it's not without its difficulties, right? Who, uh, which features are worthy, which developers are worthy. I, I'm sure there's hurdles to, to cover there, but I think this potentially is a way to, you know, bring a lot more development into Drupal and it's a way to bring other companies into Drupal as well. And I think it's a hard problem to solve, but I think solving it will, you know, uh, really improve things. So yeah, in conclusion, I think Drupal is in a good place. You know, we, we've got a really passionate community, uh, you know, we've got agencies and individuals and those individuals that, you know, have been funded by private companies to uh, develop the code. Uh, we, we do have you know mechanisms in place and i think drupal really has pioneered like this you know contribution credit concept and um and you know rewarding people through the marketplace is a great first step we also have a leadership that's thinking um about the future but you know I, in this uh presentation i've you know i've provided a few ideas there for how we can increase the recon recognition for makers and uh, you know, the big idea really is you know how can we you know, support the developers who are maybe, you know, time poor and under stress. How can we give them some financial rewards there by bringing uh, the takers into the fold in an easy way by allowing them to financially support these, um, these makers. And of course, the end goal there is to, to make Drupal survive in a competitive world and also thrive uh, for the future. Um, I've written about this in a blog post recently there. So that's on the, the morphed um, blog if you want to read about makers and takers and altruism and, and just in a, a little bit more detail.